now. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Annie Belcourt for the introduction. Just to show you. Oh, good to have got it. Yes. Okay, that's the camera. Okay. Oh, wow, there's a lot of screens here. So, <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Oki Nisto Natanako Amanisiaki. So, my name is Annie Belcourt. I am a, a professor, and we're here to learn from one of our wonderful students in the School of Public and Community Health Sciences at the University of Montana. And I am not going to do an extensive introduction. I want to save um, space and room for uh, our wonderful to Shane to provide his own introduction. Uh, but we will have some time for questions after the um, presentation today. And we'll be here to learn about American Indian traditional ceremonial practices and their role with uh, um, substance use within urban American Indian sample. So without further, I'll toss things over. All right. Um, thanks. And, uh, and as I said, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to have a little bit of technical issue. Patrick, you do not see my notes. Is that correct? That is correct. I only see your PowerPoint slide. Folks here in the room, I think you're going to probably end up seeing my notes. And so that's okay. Cause I think if we do that, then yeah, then that puts the notes over there. So you guys will know what I'm going to say before I say it. So, <laughs> all right. Well, um, Oh yeah, I forgot cameras here. So, Tashkani Toja, Niunis Tahoepesh, Waonatka, Shini Wakani Wahunosh, Minasum Pashokos, Ehenosh, Ni Nuetanosh. So, hello everybody. My name is Deshane Barnett. Um, I'm Mandan and Arikara, which are two tribes from the Mandan Hidatsa and Arikara Nation of Fort Berthold, North Dakota. In addition to my role as a PhD student here, at the University of Montana School of Public and Community Health Sciences. I also have the honor of currently serving as director and health officer for the Missoula City County Health Department. So I'm excited to share with you all today my doctoral research. Um, during our time together today, I'm going to touch on the background of how this project um, you know, really came to be, how it, how it took form. I'll go into some details about the methods, um, the aims, the results, and then I'll touch on the significance of what I believe this project offers both to academia as well as to the American Indian health field. Um, before we get started though, I need to dive in and cover some acronyms. Um, I will do my best to not use acronyms, but what you're going to find is there's a few that are just going to naturally slip out. And so I picked the ones that I think are most likely to slip out. So um, AIAN stands for American Indian Alaska Native. I subscribe to the belief that the best way to identify someone by tribe is to use the, the words from their tribe. So like when I introduced myself today and um, I said, you know, uh, I said, but what that means is I'm Nueta, which is how we say Mandan. Um, but un unfortunately, in a perfect world, that's how it would go, but there's too many um, tribes for us to be able to, to do that um, and refer to every single individual um, by their tribal background name. So the acronym AIAN stands for American Indian Alaska Native. TCP is Traditional Ceremonial Practices. Um, so that's actually what we're here to, uh, to talk about today. And so that TCP, I will probably be using quite a bit. And then KAB stands for knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. And today specifically, we're going to talk about KAB associated with TCP. So um, people's knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about traditional ceremonial practices. Um, so over the last several decades, we have come to better understand the role that historical and intergenerational traumas play in influencing the health status of American Indian and Alaska Natives. One way in which we sometimes see this occur is through disproportionately high problem substance use rates. And in response to this phenomenon, American Indian health uh, providers across the United States have developed programs and services that are aimed at reducing problem substance use. Before moving into my current role at the health department, 
I spent two decades working in the Indian health field in both tribally operated and urban Indian health programs. And as an administrator, I was always frustrated by the fact that if we had a patient come in and this patient was struggling with problem substance use, I could have them see one of my medical providers and they could receive a prescription for Suboxone, for Vivitrol, for, for whatever the, the medicine of the year happened to be at that time. I could have them see one of our uh, mental health, behavioral health clinicians, so they could see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, a counselor, and any of those visits and services, I could then turn around and get reimbursed by federal and, and by public and private payers. The minute that I wanted that same person to see our traditional practitioner, all of those payment methods were off the table. Um, and the, the, there was this persistent belief by policymakers and payers that traditional practices are not evidence-based and do, don't have a role in um, healthcare. And that's absolutely not true. And so what, what I have seen is that there is a need for us to bridge the gap between um, what we know and what evidence uh, in science shows. In, in looking at how we wanted to do this project though, so many times when people have looked at problem substance use in American Indian communities, they do it from the stance of what is wrong with the community? What is broken? What needs to be fixed? And as someone who is native myself, I know that there's nothing broken about my community. I know that my community has a lot of strengths and assets. And what we need to do is draw on those strengths and assets um, to address issues like problem substance use. And so resiliency um, is based off of the resilience theory. And, and what it says is that American Indian communities, whether they're on a reservation or in urban settings, have the resources, the protective uh, methods, approaches built in that support individual resilience of that community's members. And so what we needed to do then was draw on those assets at the community level and I believe that traditional ceremonial practices is a way to do that. One thing that makes this project different is that in the past, many projects focused on a particular tribe. And so you would have a program, a substance use program on a reservation that largely served individuals from that one tribe. And with that tribal homogeneity, what you have is very similar culture, very similar language and very similar traditional ceremonial practices. Once we move into an urban area, that's no longer the case. Uh, uh, the urban Indian health program that we partnered with for this project actually sees individuals from more than 60 different tribes. And so that's a, a number of different languages, traditions, practices. And so how can we develop an innovation that, I mean, develop an, an intervention that still draws on traditional ceremonial practices, but does it in a community that is urban multi-tribal? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then, like I mentioned, the ultimate goal was to bridge that gap between what Native communities have known for generations is effective, and then putting that into the language of science so that we can then begin to influence those policymakers and funders. Um, so that was what we this project looked at. Um, before we get too far into this, <laughs> We, we have to talk about when we say traditional ceremonial practices, what is ceremony? What constitutes ceremony? So here I have a quote from the Native Voices exhibit at the National Library of Medicine that's housed at the National Institutes of Health in Maryland. It says ceremony is an essential part of traditional Native healing because physical and spiritual health are intimately connected. Body and spirit must heal together. Wherever they take place, traditional healing ceremonies are considered sacred. And the reason that I put this quote up there rather than a definition is that our project was guided by indigenous research methodologies and specifically critical indigenous research methodologies, which says that the researcher does not define for the community what constitutes ceremony. Community members define for themselves what constitutes ceremony. So when we were working with community members and asking about ceremony, we gave a, a brief 
um, you know, exam uh, or sort of a brief, I wouldn't even call it a definition, but a brief statement. And then we gave some examples of, of very commonly known ceremonies. But then what we told the participant is, you then decide for you what constitutes ceremony. So whether they were taking our survey or participating in interviews, the, the definition of ceremony was up to the individual. So um, I'm already <laughs> behind time. Um, Indians like to talk. So um, I'm gonna go through this next slide a little quickly. Um, but the, the idea, we started to work on this project before COVID. And so what that meant was what we wanted to do was look at an individual's behavior, their participation in traditional ceremonial practices and see, is there a relationship between that behavior and substance use behaviors? And specifically, what we were hypothesizing is that do people who participate more in traditional ceremonial practices report less substance use behaviors? Um, unfortunately, we were applying for this right in March of 2020. And I think everybody in this room knows March of 2020 was the end of the world as we know it. And so what happened was we had to adapt our model because, so we didn't, we applied for it in March. We didn't get the funding until that later that fall. We didn't get to do the actual research until 2021. And by that time, communities had not been holding ceremonies in order to protect the health and safety of their members. So we couldn't ask somebody over the last 12 months, how many, how, you know, what has your participation in the ceremony looked like? Because the answer for everybody would have been almost nothing. And so what we did was we went to existing theory and we tried to develop some proxy variables. And so we came up with knowledge, attitudes, and belief. So in the beginning, I said KAB. We came up with KAB and, and that's informed by both the theory of reasoned action and the theory of planned behavior. Um, we also came up with the idea of looking at someone's access to TCP and how that might influence whether or not they're, they're able to practice. And then the theory of planned behavior specifically also mentions someone's intent. So if someone states an intent that I intend to do this, it's more likely that they're going to do that. It's not guaranteed, but it's more likely. So we looked at those three variables um, and we, we measured around those to try to see, then is there a relationship between KAB, access intent and substance use behaviors? Um, and what you're gonna see is that when we actually went through the study, our scale, our, our measure for access to TCP did not score um, high enough for its internal consistency. Um, so we didn't consider it reliable. And so there, the analyses that we're gonna go through today do not include access. They do include KAB and intent. So how did we find out about um, all, all of this information that we wanted to gather? This project had three aims. The first aim was a systematic literature review that was looking at articles, studies that have already been done on TCP as an intervention against problem substance use in American Indian communities. We did not, for the systematic review, limit it just to urban, even though we knew that our intent was to work with an urban community, we, didn't, we weren't sure that we would find enough. So in our review protocol, we said that we were going to gather, whether it was urban or reservation, and then, you know, if, if we could, we would look at, you know, is there a difference? Do, do, do the interventions, are they more effective? Um, do they show more uh, effectiveness on reservations versus urban areas or vice versa? Um, so we looked at, at uh, TCP as an intervention in AIA and communities broadly. The second aim of our project was to work with an urban Indian health program. And so throughout today, you will not hear me mention the name of the program or the community. We do that in research out of a sense of responsibility and respect and, and to protect the identities of those involved. Um, but it was an urban Indian uh, health program here in Montana. And we worked with them to do a cross-sectional community survey um, of urban adults who had contact with that urban Indian health organization. And then our third aim were these semi-structured interviews. So what we did was we sat down and uh, with our sample, and I'll talk about the sample and how we tried to make it representative. We, we met with these people and asked them their perspectives, thoughts, beliefs around developing a treatment intervention for an urban native population that draws on incorporates TCP, traditional ceremonial practices. So those were our three aims. Um, I'm just gonna go into a little bit more detail about the, each aim. Um, the first aim, the systematic review, we put together a review team 
and we made this an interdisciplinary team. The idea was that within the literature, we, we, because this is not a very highly standardized field, we weren't sure if the studies that we were gonna be reading were gonna be from psychologists, from social workers, from epidemiologists. So um, our interdisciplinary team included my, myself with a background in, in public health, a member with a PhD in health communications, a member with a PhD in social work, and a member with a PhD in clinical psychology, so that we could um, hopefully effectively evaluate these different studies. It also included two native team members and two non-native team members. However, both of the non-native team members have extensive background working in multicultural health and specifically with American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And so our process for that review was, um, so first we, we searched um, to, to get all of these studies and, and I'll, you'll see how many we got um, and, and you'll see the, the terms that we used to search. But then uh, two readers, myself and the, the second reader, the second author, um, we went through and we screened all of those articles based on their title and abstract against a set of guidelines that we developed. And so in looking at a systematic review where you're trying to work with a large number of possible articles, developing guidelines is the best practice that we found in the literature. Um, so we developed this guideline. We screened the titles and abstracts against those guidelines. I, as first reader then, once we had thrown out the, the articles that we knew were not going to meet our criteria, um, the ones that were left, we were like, we weren't sure. Just by the abstract alone, we couldn't tell. So we need to read the full article. So I went and read um, each full article. And then if in that article, if it was clear that this study did not meet the criteria, that it had to be excluded, I went ahead and set it aside. If it wasn't clear that it had to be excluded, or if I thought actually it should be included, those two types of articles went to the full team for review. And so the only articles, full articles that were excluded were those that absolutely did not meet the criteria, which I'll show on the next slide. Um, but then all the rest of them went to our full team, those four people that I talked about. Um, and so we reviewed those and decided um, which articles would be included and which would not. And so you can see here, these are the search terms that we use using a, a Boolean search uh, method, um, using the university uh, of, using a university's database. <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> I almost got in trouble there. Um, and so we plugged in each one of these, so American Indian and spiritual with the asterisk, which means it also includes spirituality, spiritually, and substance use. And then we went down the next one, American Indian and spiritual and substance of use. And so we went through all of these and what that gave us, and hopefully this is gonna be for folks here in the room, I apologize, it's gonna be small since you're also seeing my notes. Um, we came up with 5,687 potential articles. And so with the titles and abstracts, we screened, we removed 4,022 and, oh no, sorry. We excluded 3,968. Um, oh, 4,022 is after duplicates were removed, sorry. Then we excluded 3,968 based on title abstract. We had those 54 um, articles that were read in their entirety. Of those eight, were not uh, uh, eligible to be included because they were a, a review themselves. So maybe they were another systematic review, a scoping review, a literature review, um, but they, they, they were not reporting on original research. They were reporting on other studies that we would want to go and see those studies. Um, and so eight were uh, reviews. And then the study had to have both a predictor and a response measure. So it had to report on at least one measure around TCP and at least one measure around problem substance use. And then uh, if it didn't do either of those, or if it, if it didn't do both of those, it was not eligible. So you can see that some were eligible for different reasons. Uh, specifically, we wanted to look at an adult sample. Um, there's the reason that we did that is in the literature, there's a lot more work already done on youth than there are in adults. And so we, we were looking at what gaps in the literature could we possibly fill. And so we looked at an AIAN adult sample. And then also there's the preponderance of literature out there looking at this topic is qualitative and for a very good reason. So they sit down and they really explore uh, people's perspectives, interactions, experience um, with TCP and substance use. We wanted to focus on quantitative. We wanted to look at what quantitative data are available 
that we can then sort of fill that gap um, to add to the, qu the qualitative research that's already out there. So for folks here in the room, sorry, that's gonna be way too small to read. Um, but when we went through this, uh, we found 10 articles that met the inclusion criteria for our study. And you can see what, it, what ended up happening was seven of those took place with an urban community and only three took place with the reservation community. Um, we, were, we were originally, we were afraid it was gonna be the other way around that we wouldn't find much or all about urbans, but actually most of the, the research that we found was on urban populations. Sample sizes varied, you know, anywhere from, I think uh, the smallest is 10, the largest is 2,449. Our types of studies, we, we were able to find just published in 2021, an, a randomized control trial, RCT. So we were able to find one and that's in research, that's you know really what you're hoping to find is, is a bunch of RCTs. We found one and then we found a, several evaluation studies, several cross-sectional studies. So that means that they were surveying a population at a point in time. Um, and then we found also a pilot study and a prospective cohort study. And what we found is that all 10 of these studies had some kind of positive behavior outcome associated with TCP. Um, so whether each of the studies, and I'm gonna talk about this later, measured it a little bit differently. So maybe it was an odds ratio, maybe it was a difference in proportion, uh, maybe it was a, a, a difference in quantity, quality, I mean, quantity um, uh, of beverages or quantity of days um, drinking or using drugs, but all of them found, all 10 found positive behavior changes associated with TCP. So that was our first aim. And in a sequential mixed methods, we use the, each aim helps inform the next aim. So that helped us um, as we were developing our, our survey questionnaire. We worked with the Indian Health Service Nationals, uh, National Institutional Review Board and um, got approval to deliver this survey questionnaire to this urban community. We looked, um, you know, I mentioned the scales that we wanted to find, which was KAB, access, intent, and then substance use behaviors. And we were able to find some existing scales and then some we had to create ourselves. We pilot tested the survey with um, community members who would have otherwise been eligible to take the survey. And then we also had the survey reviewed by cultural advisors. And so those cultural advisors were identified by that urban Indian health program. Um, and what they were specifically looking at was, is this survey culturally appropriate? And you know, looking specifically for the context of an urban community. We, after we did all of that work, um, we delivered the survey to urban American Indian adults, so 18 years and older, living in two counties um, served by this urban Indian health program. And the survey mode was both electronic and paper. So it went out via Qualtrics um, through an email link, or we sent them a paper survey. But on the paper survey, they also had the link and a QR, QR code so that they could choose to take the survey online if they wanted to, but they had the paper survey. And that was based on whether or not their email address was in the, the clinic's electronic health record system. So if we already had the email address, we contacted them via email. If we didn't, we contacted them via the paper survey. And um, so out of those 665 individuals, we had 194 um, fully completed responses that are what make up the analysis work that I'm gonna talk about today. We, like I mentioned, whether they did it online or they sent the paper in, we entered that into Qualtrics. So we did our initial analyses in Qualtrics, and then we exported that to R to do all of our statistical analysis. And so our results for the survey. Um, when, so for the measures associated with substance use, what, what tool we decided to borrow from was the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And so um, we asked uh, as part of that about five different substance use behaviors. So we asked about alcohol, alcohol use, marijuana use, inhalant, methamphetamine, and prescription drugs um, used not as directed by a medical provider. So prescription drug abuse. Um, and what we saw is that um, due to, to low precision, we had to combine the the other drug categories. So we had a category for alcohol, a category for marijuana, 
and then methamphetamines, inhalants, and prescription drugs all had to be um, combined together for analysis. And that's actually a common approach. So the National Survey on Drug Use and Health actually does report tables with um, marijuana included and marijuana excluded for other drugs, um, because that's just it, it, for due to low precision. And so what we found, um, and this is our top gray bar, is that in our community that we sampled, 12.4% reported um, illicit uh, substance use in the last year, which is almost right on par for the national average for American Indian Alaska Natives, which is 12.4%. So, oh wait, no, sorry, 14.8%, sorry. Um, so I guess it was, for some reason, I thought it was only 1% off, but it's 2% off. So 2.4% uh, difference um, between our community, but still the idea was that we were actually lower than the national prevalence. Um, in our sample reported lower than the national prevalence. Um, alcohol is the bottom bar, and so that's the blue bar, and there was 63.4% of our uh, sample population reported using alcohol in the last year. And that also, it compares almost very well to the national prevalence, which was 61% for American Indian Alaska Natives. Where we differed in our sample was the reporting of marijuana use in the past 12 months. And so in our sample, 52.1% reported marijuana use in the last 12 months. The national sample for AIANs is 20.4%. So this was almost two and a half times higher. Now, we went and did a little bit of looking into that because that scared us a little bit at first. And what we found is that for Montana in general, this area, this region scores much higher on marijuana on the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And so we have reports that have come out in the last few years that have Montana placed at 40%. And so this difference from 40 to 52% really is not that significant. The other thing is, we were gathering these data right at the time that recreational marijuana was about to become legal in Montana. Um, and so what we did not, because the National Survey of Drug Use and Health tool that we were using does not delineate or distinguish between medical marijuana use and recreational or non-medical use. So we don't know of that 52.1, how much was medical, how much was recreational. Um, but that's something that, you know, the could probably use a little more uh, research in the future, um, looking at marijuana use. Um, and then when it came to our TCP variables, remember because of uh, low validity, we had to throw access out the window. Um, so we were left with KAB and intent. And so what we saw is that almost 55% of our um, sample population reported very high or very positive knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs regarding TCP, traditional ceremonial practices. But then we also noticed that only 36.7% expressed great high levels of intent to participate in traditional ceremonial practice. And that honestly also kind of confused us. Like, so that means that there's a chunk of people who have really positive, strong, positive knowledge, attitudes, and belief about ceremony. But when we said, will you participate once COVID is over, will you participate? They said, no of curious what was going on there and the great thing about this being a sequential mixed method study is that i'll talk about that when we get to the interviews and so um, the final part of our survey is we looked at odds ratios for reporting substance use uh past year substance use based on both kab and intent and what we saw is that for both variables. So this first one is for KAB. And, and I realize um, for those who are in the audience who are not researchers, um, this chart can seem pretty overwhelming. But what it, what it says is that after we adjusted for an individual's age and annual household income, those who reported the higher, more positive levels of knowledge, attitudes, and belief were significantly less likely to have reported alcohol use in the last year and other drug use in the last year. They were also less likely to report marijuana use, but that just wasn't significant. Um, and so what we saw is that for the alcohol and other drugs, um, that they were um, significantly less likely to report substance use. And when we look at intent, the, the same pattern holds where um, after we adjust for age and household income, those uh, who report that greater levels of intent to participate report significantly lower levels of alcohol. We're significantly less likely to report alcohol use 
um, or other drug use. And then they also were less likely to report marijuana use. So those were the results from our survey. And so our last aim for this uh, research project was the semi-structured interviews. Again, we worked with the IHS National IRB. Um, we developed a semi-structured moderator's guide and that was informed both by the, the systematic review from the, the first aim and then our survey results from the second aim. Again, we pilot tested and again, we worked with our cultural advisors to make sure that the um, moderator's guide was culturally appropriate, was not offensive, and more importantly for both the survey and the interview guide, what the cultural advisors helped us do was make sure that we were actually asking for information that the community wanted, um, that you know th this was information that they felt was important. And the, that's again, part of this idea behind uh, critical indigenous research methods is that needs are defined by the community, not by the researcher. And so our cultural advisors helped us um, make sure that we were collecting information that they felt would help inform um, services in the community. And so again, we worked with um, an adult population, so 18 years and older. They had to have been living in one of these two urban counties um, that were uh, a part of this Urban Indian Health Program service area. We, because of COVID, we conducted the majority of the interviews over Zoom, but we also offered phone or in-person options. Um, it was up to the individual to choose what was most comfortable for them. And then we, uh, I, well, I underwent a theoretical thematic an analysis um, that was uh, then reviewed by my um, faculty members. So um, a couple uh, sample questions from the moderator's guide, just to give you an idea. The first um, is, is that what we wanted to find out is what were their thoughts, perspectives, ideas on what a program could look like. So we said, we're exploring ways to incorporate TCP into programs and services aimed at preventing substance use problems. Because we're in an urban area, a program like this would have to accommodate many tribal perspectives, cultures, and backgrounds. What would you think about such a program? And then we had all kinds of prompts and follow-ups to, to really get into the weeds about what they thought. Now, I mentioned in our survey results, what we saw was that oh, uh, just over one out of every two individuals scored high on knowledge, attitudes, and belief, but only about one out of, out of every three individuals had reported this high High level of intent to participate. So we wanted to see what, what was causing that, that difference. So we asked, what, we just asked, why, why might someone report very positive personal beliefs or attitudes about TCP, but also report a low level of intent to participate in TCP? Um, and so those questions and que other questions like that helped inform the results that I'm going to share um, in the next five minutes. <laughs> so uh, for our interview, we uh, had a sample population of 11 American Indian adults. Um, you can see here, what we wanted to do is try to be um, uh, representative, not necessarily in direct proportions of the, the population, but making sure that we were hearing from different segments of the population. And so we heard from elders, both male and female. We heard from adults, both male and female. In our survey, we did have, um, several respondents who identified as two-spirit or non-binary. Unfortunately, that is missing from our, our interviews. Um, we did interview a traditional practitioner, a cultural specialist. Seven of our participants grew up on the reservation. And so uh, conversely, four did not. They grew up in, in urban areas. And then three grew up in urban areas. One grew up in a rural area, but off of the reservation. Um, and then our income range, so we had five had an annual household income of less than 40,000, which means six had an annual income of greater than 40,000. So a, a pretty even split on income. And so that was our interview population. And this is, in speaking to them, this is what we found out, was that if we're going to develop an intervention in an urban area that incorporates TCP, the very first thing is that we have to acknowledge the fact that we are in a multi-tribal community. And that came across in two different ways. One, people admitted, they're like, I know that people of other tribes live here. I'm only comfortable doing from my tribe, but I still know that other people from other tribes live here. So if things are happening from another tribe, that's great. I'm not gonna participate in them. 
but I still think they should be happening. And then we had the other side where people were like, we are multi-tribal, I'm comfortable being multi-tribal, let's have different tribal you know, traditions, uh, traditional ceremonial practices, and I'll go whenever I feel comfortable, regardless of which tribe it is. Um, and so, but, but what we heard from everybody is that we could not pick out one particular tribe and only offer TCP from one particular tribe, that we had to find a way to offer TCP from many different tribes. The second thing that we found was that they, the majority, so nine out of the 11, mentioned in their interviews that they want this process to be guided by elders. And really, that when we say the process, that it, it came up from all the way from the, the conceptualization and design to the delivery and the evaluation of whether or not it's working, they wanted elders to be involved in leading that process. Um, and you know, the, the idea was that the elders could help us, one, identify what those traditional ceremonial practices should be or could be. Two, they could also help us make sure that they were being delivered appropriately, which leads us into our third theme. We heard this also a, a lot. So we heard this out from eight of our 11 participants mentioned the need to vet traditional practitioners. And the idea, there's, a, there's two really big things here. One, that whoever is leading these traditional ceremonial practices has the knowledge, the training, and the background to do so, and that, it, that it's been tribally sanctioned, that, you know, that they, they have been given those rights in whatever way their tribe sees as appropriate. Sometimes it's hereditary, sometimes they're gifted, however those rights came to them. Um, the other thing, though, was that, unfortunately, there is a big history of abuse associated with people pretending, or not necessarily even pretending, because um, there's some actually were traditional practitioners. But what we've seen is that people in that role of traditional practitioner have historically uh, used that position to abuse people. And so what they wanted to make sure was that was not gonna happen, that the people who were in that role were not predators and that they, the, as participants, they could feel safe knowing that um, that practitioner had been vetted and was going to be operating you know, appropriately. And then the last thing um, that we learned in the interviews, because I know I need to wrap up, um, was that when it comes to our community, enculturation and acculturation, so how much you grew up on, on, on native ways, uh, language, values, et cetera, and how much you grew up on mainstream language, values, et cetera, there's this continuum. And so there are some people who, did have a chance growing up speaking their language, attending traditional ceremonial practices, and they might feel very comfortable going to those practices that are from their community. Um, other people didn't. They never had a chance to grow up with that, and they might still want to participate, but they might need um, a, an opportunity to learn what are the appropriate protocols, what should I expect when I'm, in the, when I'm in the ceremony, and that's not even limited to those people who didn't grow up around ceremony. Some of those people said, I grew up around my ceremony, and if there was ceremony offered by another tribe, I would still want to go. I just need to learn what's going on, because even though I grew up with mine, I don't know theirs. And so the idea was that if a program had a learning component and folks could have a chance to actually know what to expect, know how to behave, they would be more comfortable and more likely to participate. And so those were the guiding um, themes that came out of our interviews. And so in wrapping up, um, the, this research helped accomplish several things. First, there hadn't really been a, a, a look at what KAB intent and substance use behaviors looked like for this urban community. So, and, and before we reported these results out, we met with this urban community. So all of this data actually belongs to the community through that urban Indian health organization. And they now get to use that data to help inform future services, um, surveys, all, all of that. So um, this sort of gave us a, a baseline of, of where to start. So we know now in 2021, this is what it looked like. The other thing is that this explored an urban setting in Montana. Um, and, and so the, that we know of, this is the first study of its kind to look at TCP and substance use in an urban Montana community. Um, you know, I mentioned in the systematic review, there were seven that were urban, but none of those were here in Montana. 
And so um, that's what this study brings. Um, the idea that this was community informed, that it was driven by TCP, and that the intent is that it can then be used to inform future programming and services. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a, I hope it's seen as a contribution to the literature, to academia, but more important to me is that it's a contribution to the communities that can actually benefit from this research. Um, so I have for those of you who are really interested, um, I have my systematic review references and select references that I spoke about today and just want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who helped throughout this project. Um, you see on the on the left there, all of this happened with a lot of people helping out our testers, our advisors, the urban Indian health program. So you see here Dr. Jeffrey Peterson, Julie Cahoon were part of the research team. Dr. Brian Cochran um, helped us uh, with some of our survey tools. Dr. Yvanka Voyich um, was a part of the team that led the, the program that funded us. And Nikki Graham, as part of that program, helped us um, with a lot of our logistics. Obviously, I cannot uh, just, I cannot overstate the contribution of my dissertation community members. Like, it, it, I've heard so many stories about dissertation committees going awry, and that just, I had the exact opposite experience. I could not have done this without my committee members, and I just owe them a, a humongous debt of gratitude. And I do need to acknowledge that this research was supported by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. However, they do not stand behind what I say. So thank you. Okay, so here in the room we have Emily. Yeah, so I'm just curious about your, um, your survey and team coordinate or urban resource to fund your research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you do, um, can you, first question is, could you incentivize either of those groups to participate? And then secondly, how did you select and recruit through your, um, your research? Yes. Okay, I stopped sharing just so I could actually see that whole time. I don't know what I looked like on camera. So you guys might have been, I don't know. I don't know what you're looking at that whole time. But um, so yes, we did incentivize. So this population um, as one, when we look at research as a vulnerable population, um, but two, as, as a population that others have marginalized, I don't call it a marginalized community, but it, that others have marginalized. Um, traditionally has very low rates of participation. And so we worked um, with our funder and we were able to, for the surveys, there was a 35, 35? I think it was $35 incentive. Um, and then for the interviews, there was a $50 incentive. And then, sorry, what was the second part? How did you identify the group that um, The interview participants were selected out of two ways. One, anyone who completed the survey could volunteer to also participate in an interview. And so we looked at that list. And then from that list, we, we, that's where we drew from first. But then we noticed like, you know, oh, there's actually there are not enough elders, <laughs> especially elder men. Um, so we, we want to grab, you know, one or two more of those. Um, so we did that. And, and we just looked at in order to make it as representative as possible, where we didn't see a, a particular demographic um, in the those who volunteered. We then um, worked with the Urban Indian Health Program to identify people in the community. Hi, Deshane. This is Gil. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, I was just wondering a couple of things, a couple of questions. So. Um, you know, when people talk about knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, I mean, sometimes researchers will really um, try to distinguish between those three things in terms of how they operationalize their research and their research design. Other researchers seem to be okay with, um, with allowing maybe a little bit more ambiguity between those categories. Like what really distinguishes knowledge from beliefs, right? Again, some researchers really want to distinguish them, others don't. 
So I was wondering first if you could just talk a little bit about how how you might have approached uh, those sorts of distinctions and operationalizations of those categories. And then along the same lines, you know, talking about elders, traditional practitioners, and cultural spe specialists, I'm wondering um, how you might have operationalized this. Uh, distinctions between those categories, right? I mean, I don't know much, but it seems like a person, an individual might be able to occupy more than one of those categories. So a uh, traditional practitioner, for instance, could also be considered an elder. So uh, again, if you could kind of maybe tell us a little bit about how you approach that sort of distinction. Thank you. Yeah. And so what I will say is that for everything that Gil just mentioned above, um, we let somebody else make that call. <laughs> so for our KAB scale, we borrowed from, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of the, it's at, it's out of the University of Washington, um, and it's Bonnie Duran's Institute, um, and I forget the acronym for the institute, but it's the scale for a survey that she used for the, what's called the Honor Project, and so that scale was developed um, by Bonnie Duran and her team out of University of Washington. And in it, you're, you're right, it, it, it includes um, items in the scale that could, one could say this is knowledge, but it's not really belief. And another one could be more belief and not knowledge. Um, and, and so it was a 13 item scale um, and it, it included items that measured generally knowledge, attitudes and beliefs. Um, and so, because it had already been validated and because it was designed and validated with an American Indian um, community, that's the, the scale that we borrowed from for KAB. Um, and then I mentioned, so our access scale, the alpha, um, the Chromebox alpha came back on that in the, in the 40s, um, it, was, it was low. Um, our intent scale that we developed in-house ourselves came back with the Chromebox alpha of 85, but then the KAB, because it, we used the previous, we just, um, adapted slightly the this previously validated instrument um, it came back at 90 basically 95 I think it was 94.9 um, and so that was the KAB scale that we used and then as far as indicating um, what counts as elder traditional practitioner and um, cultural what was specialist I think um, traditional practitioner and cultural specialists were actually two roles uh, at that urban Indian health program so the Urban Indian Health Program designated them. This is our traditional practitioner. This is our cultural specialist. Um, and then for elders in our survey, we um, indicated elder anyone who is 56 years or older. And I know that maybe in other communities that seems young to, to start an elder category, but um, because of American Indian community experiencing shorter life expectancies, um, we made that cut off at 56. Thank you. Um, so I see Helen asked, oh, <laughs> do you plan to publish this impactful work? Yes, absolutely. So we will have, um, what, it could go one of two ways, an article specifically about the systematic review, an article specifically about the survey, and then one specifically about the interviews, or depending on the journal, they might want the interviews and survey to be together. So it could end up being two articles or three articles, but we wrote them as three separate articles. Maybe Maya. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Well, I wanted to thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, and I just wanted to ask because you are uniquely positioned as a, you know, within the public health world in your current position and as a researcher um, in this field, what do you think you will, what do you think your steps moving forward will be to try to remedy the issues that you saw during your career previously and being able to integrate these into being reimbursable um, and more common within the healthcare system? So we approached this um, through its, the funding source as a developmental project. 
the next step, um, if, if we're able to go there, which I would love, is um, that we continue the development of a potential intervention and then we pilot tested it, pilot test it. So we would get funding to pilot test. And then depending on that, the next step would be to get funding for a clinical trial. And so in our systematic review, when you saw that one RCT, that's actually how they did it. So they did first their developmental award, then they did their pilot award. And then which, so they, you actually saw two of the articles next to each other with the same, same author. That's because one was when they were piloting it. And then the next one was when they were doing their RCT. And so in it, ideally what I would love is that this project moves in that same way that we actually develop an intervention, we pilot it, and then we, we get a clinic funding for a clinical trial, and then it gets out there into the hands of um, not just one community, but as many communities that can benefit from it as possible. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that it would, it, it's going to be not necessarily an easy job, but the, what we heard from the participants was that one way to do that, and it's not necessarily the end all do all, but one way to do that is to work with the elders in our community who might be from that tribe. So if somebody is over here and they say they're from a particular tribe and because I don't want to call anyone out. I'll only use my tribe as the example. So they're they're over here in Missoula, but they say they're they're Mandan or they're Rikra, and they you know want to lead these um, traditional ceremonial practices. That we find elders in this community from that tribe and say, "Is this okay? Do you know this person? Is this is this really a ceremony that you know you you would expect to see?" And and then they can talk to that person, sort of interview them, and be like, you know, well, where did you get the rights? How do you do it? How do you do your sweat? How do you do this? And the elders can help um, guide us and say, okay, yes, you know, I, I feel comfortable or, or I don't feel comfortable. We absolutely could, and in an ideal world, should be checking with the tribes themselves. Um, some tribes actually do have resources for their traditional practitioners. So they might have a traditional practitioner's council, or they might have like a cultural council. And so you can um, work directly with the tribe and the, the tribe can say, yes, we recognize this person as having the rights and authorities to do this. Um, beyond that, there's also, and again, this is a lot of work beyond that, there's also asking them, well, what other com communities have you lived and worked in? And, you know, can you give us names from those communities and, and we can, you know, try to reach out and, and basically almost like a job interview, um, vetting their qualifications. It is absolutely tricky though, because a traditional practitioner is not going to walk in with, a license from traditional practitioner school saying they have the, the training and certification to do what we're asking them to do. So it's absolutely tricky, um, but I think it's something that programs and, and organizations can be proactive about and hopefully prevent as much damage as possible. Um, and then I know Patrick, we're, we're rounding up. Um, I just see one more question under CM, evidence based under CMS, can you give me a snapshot opinion on how under the same definition or the barriers? Oh, so one of the reasons too that I wanted um, to, to do this study in this way is that in Washington, Washington State Medicaid now recognizes traditional medicine. And if you are a Medicaid patient in Washington and you go to say the, the Seattle Indian Health Board for services, their traditional medicine is now reimbursed through Medicaid. And so that's the idea is that we work to get a pilot project. And then what we have is Medicaid says, okay, within these constraints, we will go ahead and list traditional medicine as acceptable. Um, and that's a whole process that it's gonna take years. Um, and I, I would love to talk to you more about it, Megan, but I know Patrick's gonna kick me off this computer in one minute. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Deshane. That was a wonderful presentation on a very uh, impactful study. Uh, and hopefully we will hear more of that moving forward with your, your publications and, and uh, more research, hopefully. Uh, so I wanted to thank everyone for attending. Just as a reminder, we will be back here for the Global Public Health Seminar Series again next Monday 
uh, April 25th at two o'clock mountain time. Uh, we will be having our first set of our applied practicum experience presentations. These are our master's students and the master's of public health program and the master's of public health community health and prevention sciences programs. We'll be giving their APE presentations. Uh, so we hope you will join us then. Until then, thank you and have a great day. Thanks so much to Shane. Thank you, everyone.